This is Stand Up For The Truth, educating, empowering, and connecting Christians to stand on God's word and truth. The man who won't stand up for his own principles is not really a man at all. Get involved by emailing comments at standupforthetruth.com or calling us on the queue line. You can't handle the truth. Now, here's the co-host of Stand Up For The Truth, Amy Spreeman. Welcome, Wisconsin and the world. My name is Amy Spreeman, and uh, you know what? For the first time in Stand Up For The Truth history, uh, the program you're listening to today is actually pre-recorded. We, we usually do it live. In fact, we've done that for the last four point uh, whatever years, uh, but this is the first time that both Mike LeMay and I have had to be uh, out of the office at two separate different deals. So uh, what you're getting today is fresh content, though. We taped this a uh, couple days ago, and uh, in just a moment, I'm going to be introducing Warren Smith. He uh, talked with me a couple days ago about some very interesting news and a new uh, project that he's working on. But let me tell you who he is, because uh, Warren Smith is a frequent guest on Stand Up For The Truth. Uh, his latest book, and uh, we've got links to this on our website, standupforthetruth.com, it's titled Another Jesus Calling, How False Christs Are Entering the Church Through Contemplative Prayer. It was a, a very uh, widely uh, shared interview. So we're going to uh, link you there. Um, it's a must read. He is also the author of several pamphlets available at uh, Lighthouse Trails Publishing, including a 16 page tract we talked about before Changing Jesus Calling Damage Control for a False Christ. It's about how uh, Thomas Nelson Publishing has really basically whitewashed the New Age elements and uh, sources from Jesus Calling. But it is his latest pamphlet that we're going to really be uh, discussing today. And the title of it is False Revival Coming, Part 1, Holy Laughter or Strong Delusion. And it's just been made available at Lighthouse. We've got the links for it on our website, and you'll want to grab a few of those to share. Uh, Warren Smith, welcome back to Stand Up For The Truth. Really glad you could join us. Thanks, Amy. It's good to be with you. Well, I'm glad we're taking on this topic because, Warren, I've been hearing a lot about uh, Christian revival and how, it, you know, entire cities are coming together. And really, revival is something the Bible talks about as a spiritual uh, reawakening from a, a state of dormancy or stagnation to uh, into the life of a believer. Uh, we become regenerated by the Holy Spirit, and that's an individual thing. Um, but, Warren, you, you've been studying uh, false revival, actually, over the years. You've written a new pamphlet about it. Uh, why did you decide to write this pamphlet? Well, true revival is a wonderful thing. Um, one of the things that's concerned a lot of us, and probably the basis for your program, is that there are things that we're being told that just really aren't true. One of the things that really troubles me is that the false teachers that are out there, and that's, this would especially include Oprah Winfrey, uh, her recent tour with uh, people like Rob Bell, calling himself an evangelical pastor, and there's almost nothing being said or written about the false teachers and the false teachings. It's kind of like 1 Corinthians 14.8. If the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for the battle? We're not getting the warnings, but yet we're getting a big cry for revivals coming. God's got an outpouring that he's bringing. And some of the people that are doing this are not talking about the things that are really at the basis of what should be true revival, which is a recognition of false teachings and a proclamation of the truth that's in the Bible. It's almost like revival is becoming kind of a, a, a cry of like mom and apple pie. Like as long as you're saying revival and, um, you know, celebrate America or whatever, then somehow or another everything that comes under that umbrella is okay. Well, what happened was 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, I watched what was going on in Toronto, the so-called Toronto Blessing. Yes. I think a, a lot of people in the audience are younger. They maybe aren't even familiar with what that was. But a thing called holy laughter broke out, their words, broke out in Toronto. Uh, the way that it happened was that there was a man, uh, a South African evangelist by the name of Rodney Howard Brown, who I think it was back in 1979, he was praying and he, he basically told God, you come down here and touch me, or I'm going to come up there and touch you. And he said that he got a, just a jolt of kind of an electrical output coming from God, and he broke into laughter and weeping and speaking in tongues. Um, this is the man that is responsible for the whole holy laughter movement because he took this whole 
kind of circumstance that happened to him, and he then imparted it to others. Uh, one of the people that he imparted it to was a man by the name of Randy Clark. He was a uh, pastor in St. Louis, uh, Missouri. And Randy Clark, you know, was at a very low point in his ministry, feeling very uh, just bankrupt spiritually, just kind of depressed. And he went to where Rodney, Rodney Howard Brown was speaking. It was actually the location where he didn't really even want to go, but he felt that he needed to go and to, to be a part of whatever this was. And so Rodney Howard Brown laid hands on him, and he broke into laughter. He, it, see, this holy laughter is transferable. It's an impartation. Uh, I remember one account where there was a pastor that came into uh, a church. I was told this story, and this holy laughter pastor had a sport coat that he was wearing, and then people from the congregation would come up, and he would put the sport coat on them, and they would just crack up, start laughing, fall to the floor in convulsions, sometimes barking like dogs. So this Randy Clark, you know, brought it back to his church in St. Louis, and they all got the impartation and went into this holy laughter movement. And then Pastor John Arnott, uh, he was the uh, lead pastor at uh, Toronto Vineyard up in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, invited uh, Randy Clark to come for several days and to bring whatever this was with him, and he did. And all of a sudden, Toronto was hit. It's kind of like you, what they call it is being hit with revival. Mm. And the revival was supposedly that God was just laughing through his people, bringing a spirit of joy. They tried to equate the word joy with laughter. So this thing broke out, and all of a sudden, you've got like 2,300 pastors flying in from around the world to get this new move of God. And I was watching this stuff happen on television. There were shows where they were talking about this great thing that God was doing. And it just really, it looked wrong. And it just, it made me just like, what is, this isn't the way the Lord operates. You know, especially having come out of the New Age movement with all of the deception, the false Christ, the false Christ that Oprah is preaching, you know, through the Course of Miracles and a lot of her New Age teachers, that denies what happened on the cross, denies who Jesus really is according to Scripture, not the new revelations, the new truths that are coming through these channeled things like uh, The Course in Miracles, and I believe uh, Sarah Young's book, Jesus Calling, has some of these false teachings. That's why I wrote about it. So this thing's breaking out, and, you know, it's 1994, and I just decided I'm, I'm going to research this thing and write an article, and I did. And it was published in several discernment um, newsletters and, and journals, and I called it holy laughter or strong delusion, question mark. And I gave the background on how um, Rodney Howard Brown, you know, supposedly was, you know, anointed by the Lord to do revival. And, and Brown says that the Lord basically told him that, uh, well, here's a quote in, on Rodney Howard Brown's revival.com website. By the way, if you Google the word revival, just the word revival, the first person that comes up on the website today is Rodney Howard Brown. That's a huge said, name. Yeah, that that's a huge name in, in um, circles, and I, I've heard the name before. Uh, before you move on, Warren, I, I would like to actually, because I know that we've got a y lot of younger people who weren't around for the whole uh, Toronto uh, blessing or, or whatever that was, the that's outpouring. That's what they called it, yeah, the Toronto blessing. You know, we've actually, I, I did some research, we've got some sound of what the so-called holy laughter sounds like. It's actually quite disturbing, folks, so uh, gird yourselves, because uh, this is what holy laughter sounds like. I don't understand why people have a problem with joy in church. <laughs> because you can come to church all happy, excited, talking to your friend. The moment you walk in the door, everybody's stirring, you know, they're sitting there. You don't want to even cough. You, know, you don't want to even open up a mint because now you're in the presence of God. It's all right. This, this is called joy. It's okay. The Lord's in total favor of it. You can have some. God's not grumpy. He's not throwing furniture around. Um, uh, Jesus is not depressed. So Jesus didn't come to condemn. If you look at a lot of religious people, that's all they're doing. The best way I could describe it is drunkenness. Like you're inebriated. I mean, you're you're there. You're aware of what's going on, but you don't really want to stop. 
Well, uh, Warren, that was holy laughter. Uh, Rodney Howard Brown, uh, that's actually quite chilling. It doesn't sound like any joy I've ever heard of uh, in Scripture, does it to you? No. Um, the reason I wrote the article was to take a deeper look. I think Christians, uh, we tend to sometimes just grab on to whatever somebody's telling us we should grab on to, and we don't really look to Scripture. We don't study the Word of God. We don't rightly divide the Word of Truth. Or like in Acts 17.11, the Bereans were commended for checking out what's going on and looking at the Word of God to see if these things are so. We're getting very little, if anything, from major leaders about testing the spirits these days. Somehow we're supposed to just trust them, trust what God is telling them. And like in Rodney Howard Brown's case, he was told, you know, back at the time when he was uh, imparted with this quote-unquote holy laughter, he said that God told him to, quote, stir up the churches and tell them to get ready for the coming revival. And then he, this is fairly outrageous, but he says the Lord also told he and his wife that God would be using them in the same way that he used Joseph in Egypt. Um, what I did in my article is I gave the background, and then I gave 14 reasons why we should reconsider what was going on in the name of holy laughter. And I basically looked at what the Bible says about laughter. And uh, I, I went scripture by scripture, and I said there is no case at all being made for holy laughter, especially in the last days when Jesus warned in Matthew 24, 3 to 5, when the disciples said, what will be the sign of your return and the end of the world? He said, take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. That's what, in the New Age, we were all being told that we were Christ. So it's a very sobering uh, thing that's going on in the world today with all these false teachings coming through prominent people like Oprah Winfrey. Uh, and a lot of this stuff, God in everyone, is sneaking into people's books like Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life. It's in Jesus Calling. It's in the Shack. We've done programs on this. The bottom line of the New Age deception is that God is in everyone and everything. Psalm 11.3 says, If the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? So instead of concentrating on the deception and being aware of that, and we don't have to overdo it, but because it's being underdone, we have to come back on the other side and make sure people realize that the Bible warns about very sobering, serious deception at the end, not some worldwide revival. There's no case to be made for some kind of worldwide revival. What we're hearing a lot in the church right now is that we're on the verge of a second Pentecost. There's actually an organization mm -hmm. called Empower 21. Uh, the uh, president, uh, George Wood of the Assembly of God Church, has gotten together with the head of Oral Roberts University. They've got people like Bethel's Bill Johnson on board. A lot of questionable things that and all of a sudden, hey, we're on the verge of a, of a worldwide spiritual awakening. Guess what? I wrote a book called False Christ Coming. Does anybody care? And some of the New Age leaders, particularly Barbara Marks Hubbard, who was actually nominated for vice president at the 1984 Democratic Convention, a, a, a revered woman in the New Age and in the world, she said that Christ told her that there's a planetary Pentecost coming. It's going to be a worldwide revival. And we're not hearing anything about the counterfeit. Well, I, I wouldn't even say counterfeit because it's not a counterfeit because there's nothing in the Bible to indicate that we're going to have a worldwide revival. So we're getting this worldwide Pentecost is being put forward by both church leaders and by the New Age. And one of the concerns that I listed in my 1994 article was that are we going to someday see a merging of the New Age planetary Pentecost with this second Pentecost that the church you know, I, I actually, it wasn't the second Pentecost back when I did it, but I said, are we going to see something in the name of Pentecost revival in the future that's going to link up with the New Age? And that's what I see happening now. So with this prominence of Rodney Howard Brown, when I say prominence, um, he has a 3,000-member church in Tampa, Florida. He's never gone away. He's never renounced holy laughter. Um, he's just continued to move through the years. And I was at a conference up in Bend, Oregon, earlier this year, last summer, I mean, last year, uh, last summer, and I was with uh, Tom McMahon of the Berean Call, 
And he said, Warren, he said, did you know that Rodney Howard Brown did a uh, two-week Celebrate America conference in Washington, D.C., and that he spoke with a number of high-level names, like uh, Congresswoman Michelle Bachman, uh, retired General uh, Jerry Boykin. Um, Each night, Rodney Howard Brown, who headlined this in the uh, DAR, Daughters of American Revolution, Constitution Hall in Washington, D.C., Rodney Howard Brown was the lead speaker each night, and then he would have a guest speaker. Another speaker was the uh, chaplain from the United States Senate. Uh, There was a night called the Harbinger Night, where Rodney Howard Brown spoke with Jonathan Kahn. You're Um, kidding. Wow. No, no. So I I said to Tom, I said, you know, are you serious? Because I wrote this article back in 1994, and I, you know, I I, I walked away and did other things. I haven't tried to follow Rodney Howard Brown. I just didn't really realize that he had continued to be a a force, if you will. He used to make a force be with you, a force in the church through the years, and that somehow he's gotten enough credibility to show up in Washington, D.C. Well, in, in doing a little bit more research, I noticed that in 1999, Rodney Howard Brown um, made it very clear, and, and this was actually part of the uh, literature for the Celebrate America last year. It says, Celebrate America, 14-day national event in Washington, D.C., uh, announces list of speakers. Dr. Rodney Howard Brown, who filled Madison Square Garden for three weeks, hosts mega event in Washington's DAR Constitution Hall, July 1st through 19th, celebrating America's spiritual heritage in a united bipartisan call for a spiritual awakening in our nation. So, is, just, Now, is that coming up this year also, Warren? I don't know. I, I know that he travels around. He does conferences with Bill Johnson of Bethel Church and with Randy Clark. Uh, Randy Clark, you know, now is on his own in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania with the Global Awakening conferences that he does around the country. But I think what I'm trying to say is that we're being given, you know, revival through men that were largely discredited uh, by the people that I respect back in those days. And I'll give you a specific example. Rodney Howard Brown in 1999, he apparently filled Madison Square Garden, but Pastor David Wilkerson, who had the big church in New York City, highly respected, uh, a prophetic voice through the years warning about the things that were coming down on this nation. He told his people, you could read it in Charisma magazine, uh, in an issue that, uh, gosh, it was back uh, in, that, in that same period of time. Um, and the title of it, I think, was um, uh, David Wilkerson Blasts Faith Preachers or something like that. You yeah. can, uh, maybe you can post it for me. I'll post it on today's show. Yeah. Post, yes. But he basically, he basically, what Wilkerson said was he told his people to stay away from Rodney Howard Brown's thing. He, he said that he's seen clips like the one that you just played. Uh, and you can anybody goes on YouTube if you want to know what holy laughter is if you want if you think this is from God you can watch that but um, he t- David Wilkerson said that when he was shown clips of what what Rodney Howard Brown was doing it made him weep uh. he said this was a perversion of God's Holy Spirit and one of the points that I made in my article was that the, there's a case in the Bible made for holy sorrow rather than holy laughter and the reason there's holy sorrow is because we're seeing things like this going on. And we're seeing people with reputations aligning with him. I'm not sure what they have in mind. Maybe they don't understand, you know, what this man, the, the havoc that he's re- reaped, wreaked in the church over the years. But what would happen, these pastors would come to Toronto. They would get the impartation of the Spirit. Uh, I was in San Francisco at the time, and I talked with some of the people at the San Francisco Vineyard. And they were bringing it back, spreading it around. <clears throat> it was just, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, it was just um, sad to see that people thought that this was what revival was. Revival, to me, is understanding the depth of the deception that's going on, the lack of warnings that are coming from church leaders, and there's this emphasis on, on experience, spiritual experience, rather than um, the Word of God and the warnings that are clearly there in Scripture. So <clears throat> I decided um, that it was important to bring back that article that I wrote in 1994, what looked like a relatively, a, you know, something that was relegated to a, a period in time. This has never gone away. However, what I've noticed is that Rodney Howard Brown, 
Um, he's considerably, you know, slimmed down. He's kind of reinvented the way he presents things. Uh, I don't know that he's doing holy laughter today, but I'm not aware of him ever repenting or saying that this was not from God. It started his ministry, which has continued through the years, and now he's got this revival.com. Uh, he's joining together with people like Beth, anybody that's looking at Bethel Church these days. Oh, yes. There's a whole experiential thing that's going on here that I do not believe is from God, and yet we're being told that this is a, a move of God where he's bringing a new thing into the church, new truths, new revelations, goes along with things like uh, Jesus calling. It goes along with Washington, D.C. Pastor Mark Battison's um, The Circle Maker, which is telling people to pray in a circle and trying to give some kind of uh, justification from a first century Jewish rabbi. Um, and and yet circles are, you know, that that's pagans, witches, yeah. Satanists pray in circles. All of this stuff is flooding in the shack. Um, other things that we've mentioned before in other programs, and there's no warnings about about a very clever adversary who knows how to take advantage of well-intentioned Christians who want to believe that they're involved in something important for God, but they're actually walking into the very deception that Jesus told us to watch out for. Well, we need to talk more about that, Warren. You know what? Why don't we do this? We'll give our, our voices a little break. Um, and by the way, as you were speaking just now, I, I did Google the um, spring conference for the uh, Celebrate America DC. And there he is again this uh, January, or I'm sorry, July 1st, uh, Rodney Howard Brown and all the cast of characters that you just mentioned as well uh, going to be at this conference. So we'll take a look at that. But uh, let's do this. We'll take a break. And again, this is a, a taped program from a couple of days ago. So uh, hold your phone calls and, and take a listen. We'll be back in just a moment with our special guest, Warren Smith. If you want to contact us about any of the topics discussed today, email your questions to comments at standupforthetruth.com. You can also call your questions in on the queue lines 494-9010 in Green Bay or 1-800-979-9010 nationwide. Stand up for the truth. We'll continue in a moment on Q90 FM. This is Stand Up for the Truth. Call in your questions now at 494 9010 in Green Bay or 1 800 979 9010 nationwide. Now, back to Amy Spreeman. Well, welcome back to Stand Up for the Truth, everyone. Uh, we are back this again, just to remind you, a pre-taped program from a couple days ago. Fresh content, though. You haven't heard this. Uh, back with our special guest, Warren Smith, who's written uh, False Revival Coming, Holy Laughter or Strong Delusion. Big question mark there, he's asking. And it's part one. So, uh, Warren, is there going to be a part two? Yeah, I think um, we, we wanted to just we, we want to put this out to, to have people think a little bit more deeply before we just go um, headlong into what we're being told is a revival from God, and that's what happened with uh, Toronto. Uh, people were just, "Hey, this is this is from God. Go there and get it. Get hit with revival," was the expression. Get drunk with holy laughter, and the argument was that at Pentecost, the people that were you know speaking in other languages were perceived to have been drinking by people there. And so they're, they're saying that holy laughter is just similar to Pentecost, where you're being, quote-unquote, drunken with holy laughter. The thing I find outrageous is that, that Christian leaders would believe that they can bring on a second Pentecost, like they can make it happen, and that it can be even bigger and, and more widespread than the original one. That's the deception. Remember, in Revelation, it says the whole world is going to be deceived. It doesn't say the whole world is going to have a planet or have a planetary Pentecost, yeah. a second Pentecost. So um, the expression, we're believing God for revival, I, I, I look at that and I go, wait a minute, what? we're believing God? It's almost like we're visualizing, we're reimagining, or we're, we're going to create, we're going to co-create revival with God, where we're to do God's will, God's will be done. You know, if he wants to bring revival to the church, he certainly can do that. But it's usually when people are repentant about false teachings. Usually you don't have people who fall into categories that could be certainly construed as false teachers leading a revival. So I think people need to go a little bit more deeply into what is revival. And I think in the second booklet we'll, we'll try to, you know, what is revival mm -hmm. and get some statements from people that are authorities on revival. And, you know, are we going to continue to see Bethel Church and Randy Clark and Rodney Howard Brown leading the church into revival? Um, 
that would really that that troubles me deeply, mm. and it should trouble any any Christian. I, the line that comes to mind is a, a song from some of us that have been around for a while. In the '60s, Bob Dylan had a line in one of his songs, and it said, "Don't follow leaders; watch your parking meters." And what he was basically saying is, just because somebody's a leader, you know, you can't trust, you know, that that they were doing the right thing. You've got to measure what they're saying by the Word of God. So, uh, for instance, in just I think it's like next week, um, Jesus Culture, you know, the worship group, the outgrowth growth group from Bethel Church in Reading, yes. you know, Apostolic Reformation, they've moved down to Sacramento and have started a church down there. Mm-hmm. They're holding a, a, a revival-type conference at the University of California Davis Pavilion, and they are basically um, saying that this is on the cusp of a revival from God, and we, we have to be really careful when we see tickets for religious events being sold at a University of California ticket office where we have people that are coming from a church that is highly associated with Rodney Howard Brown, with with this whole push for revival. If you study the teachings closely, some of the things, there's a book called The Physics of Heaven that has come out of Bethel Church. And what they're basically doing is they're, what I warned about in my book, A Wonderful Deception, they're using quantum physics to try to spiritually demonstrate that God is in everyone and everything. I believe that's where it's going. Okay. And one of the um, people that's very high up, just under Bill Johnson in that church, on a Facebook entry that somebody sent to me, he said that, you know, we refuse to have an end times eschatology that empowers a disempowered devil. Wow. That reminds me of Rick Warren's statement in A Purpose Driven Life when he said it helps to know that Satan is entirely predictable. Or Robert Schuller, who said, if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you'll never have to worry about the devil. That's not what First Peter 5, 8 says. It, it says that the devil, as a, a roaring lion, is prowling around. And I see him operating through people that are ecstatic about the New Age, like Oprah Winfrey, Winfrey uh, like we were, things that are happening in the church. To discount the devil's influence is to completely wipe out the fact that we are told that the world's being conditioned for an antichrist figure. That's being lost. It's revival, 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 rather than, hey, watch out for the deception. So the thing that goes along with this is that some of the people who are saying that they've been told by the Lord that an outpouring's coming, that revival's coming, they're warning about those who would say that this might not be from God. They're saying that these are the scoffers that the Bible warned about. So the only deception that some of these church leaders are warning about are those, they're warning about those who are warning about deception. It's really convoluted, and that's the way the devil operates. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the people involved are really sincere. They really believe that a major revival is coming. But excuse me, when I see Rodney Howard Brown and people that are pushing, you know, Sarah Young, I mean, I could just see it. Rodney Howard Brown holding hands with Sarah Young, with Benny Hinn, with President Obama, with Rick Warren, all on their knees, calling for a great spiritual awakening in this country. Excuse me, if if we're going to have revival, we need to repent of the false teachings first. Yes. That's when people are broken and revival can be brought in. But you don't have false teachers, you know, bringing in revival. And I'm sorry, David Wilkerson made it very clear that he felt that what Rodney Howard Brown was doing was completely wrong. And I want to make that clear that we have do have some men, and unfortunately, David Wilkerson was in a, a car accident, and he's, he's now the late David Wilkerson. But there are voices out there that have expressed concern. There are not many, but I think we need to have more people stepping forward talking about this possible false revival. Now, we can have a true revival, but let's do it based on exposing when Oprah Winfrey is traveling around with a so-called evangelical pastor like Rob Bell, and she's pushing the teachings of A Course in Miracles that says a slain Christ has no meaning. The journey to the cross should be the last useless journey. Don't make the pathetic error of clinging to the old rugged cross. She taught these things through Marianne Williamson on her radio uh, show three times a day, every day, throughout 2008. I'm not sure why this doesn't bother our Christian leaders, why they're not bringing this out. It's almost like, hey, we've got more important things to do. We've got revival. You know, we're going we're gonna to bring America back to its 
foundational underpinnings. Well, unfortunately, some of the foundational underpinnings of this country are mixed in with the occult. We need to expose, just like Ephesians 5, the Apostle Paul said, it's a shame we have to talk about these things, but we need to bring the things of darkness into the light. Then we can have revival, but we don't have a man who says, God, you come down here and touch me, or I'm going to come up there and touch you. That's the Tower of Babel. Yes. That's what they were doing. They were building a tower to heaven, and God cast it down. And he said, now that this people is one, and they have one language, there's nothing that can be restrained from their imagination. So this whole thing on getting hit with a spiritual experience, whether it's Jesus calling or whether it's this call for revival from Rodney Howard Brown, and I'm not, again, I'm not sure why we're watching people that are in respected positions. I, maybe they just don't know. Maybe they haven't seen these clips and, and some of, listen to some of the statements that have been made by some of our Christian leaders in the past. But we need to, to, to look, take a closer look at this before we just jump into some kind of a, a head scale, full on revival and not knowing what's, what's really at the basis of it. So let's just take a closer look. That's all I'm saying. And that's why we're bringing back my article. And that's we'll be working on a, a second part that will try to take a closer look at how this thing's moving into this next year. Because this year seems to be with Jesus culture moving into Sacramento. And, and they're basically saying, uh, well, here's, here's the headline for this Jesus Culture Conference in Sacramento, Davis. One encounter changes everything. Wow. Well, we saw that happen to Toronto Blessing. One encounter, one impartation. These people broke into holy laughter, and they're now into the experiential. This is what happened to me when I was in the New Age. I saw a psychic. I didn't know what I was doing. A ball of light manifested over my head. And I was told that I had a lot of help on the other side, that God was with me, and boom, I was off into the new age. We've got to be, we come, let us reason together. Let's not get caught up in some huge experiential thing. Yes, so, and I think yeah. when we get caught up in the experiential, our, our flesh wants to experience God, uh, but God told us that his word is sufficient and we ought not to depart from uh, what was written. Paul says that. Uh, and so if the Bible is sufficient, um, we have what God spoke to us in his written word, don't we? The Bible is sufficient. That's why. That's really why we did a recent booklet at Lighthouse Trails, The Awesome Wonder of God's Word, what God's Word says about God's Word. And, you know, maybe, you know, maybe you can post that on your website. So I would be happy to. That because here's the thing, Amy, God could break in on this phone call right now and, and this interview, and he could speak if he wants to. But this thing about we're believing God for revival, you know, that's like we're, we're going to make it happen because we're going to believe that it's going to happen. That gets into the word of faith. That gets into a lot of, I mean, in Psalm, I think it's Psalm 106, it said, God gave them their request but sent leanness into their soul. People say, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I want more, I want more. Uh, you know, God Calling, the book that inspired, the New Age book that inspired Sarah Young's book, Jesus Calling, um, they, they wanted more. They, 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 they felt they were being special because they were getting this new revelation from, quote, unquote, the living Christ. And Sarah Young has some teachings in her book where she basically, well, she's got a she's got a uh, devotional Bible where she has put 250 of her channeled messages from quote unquote Jesus in the Bible, and she said that because her messages are based on the inerrant Word of God, putting them in the Bible seemed like a perfectly appropriate place to be. Unfortunately, she's got stuff in there that's unscriptural. The Jesus of Jesus calling contradicts. We talked about this in previous programs. I won't. I won't go over it again. But now Thomas Nelson is removing that controversial material, and now I understand they're going to be doing Bible studies with Jesus calling. Oh, I think dear. people need yeah. to get a grip and just take a deep breath. Don't go into silence, but go into go into <laughs> prayer. Yes. Say, Lord, is this the deception that you warned about? Are we looking at it right in the eyes? Is it coming down the pike for this coming year? Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, what you're telling us is that we're going to see uh, more calls for revival, more direct revelation and experiences outside of Scripture, more signs of wonders, more uh, mysticism, more. Um, let's talk about the more merging and melding of religions and movements. I We're seeing a lot of those. Are, are, do you see more of those headlines uh, to come for yeah, us in 2015? Yeah, I mean, recently Rick Warren's gone to the Vatican. I've yeah. got I've got. Um, three quotes from Vatican II in my book, Another Jesus Calling, where 
the doctrine of the Catholic Church. Um, I don't have it, you know, right in my mind or right in front of me, but basically one of them was uh, God became man so that man could become God. Uh, you know, now that you're a believer, you're Christ. I mean, very, we, we do not match up with the Catholic faith. No. Um, to, to try to bring us into the Catholic Church is to go against what the Reformation was all about. Rick Warren is calling for a new Reformation, just like Robert Schuller did. Yeah, well, because and Robert, not only that, that he's yeah. uh, endorsed that book, uh, Catholics Come Home, and uh, we've we've done stories on that before. I'll link that up as well, Warren, but uh, it's yeah. very disturbing, the, the ecumenical uh, movement that's going on, isn't it? It is. Uh, I remember Rick Warren saying... Um, he said the New Age is, is a bunch of baloney. Well, it's a little bit deeper than that, Rick. It's, uh, it's, it's the major deception that Jesus warned about, and you're being deceived not to see that. He's sort of pushing off to the side. And then he says, hey, can't we all just get along? Well, if Rick read the Bible closely, uh, he would see that Jesus said, they hated me, they're going to hate you. They persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. They called me Beelzebub or Satan, and they're going to call you Satan. If you hold to the true Jesus Christ... You know, if you want what's true, it's going to be an immensely joyous journey, but it's also going to be a very difficult journey because the world does not like the true Jesus Christ. And we're watching the true Jesus Christ being transformed into another Jesus, 2 Corinthians 2.11. Paul warned that and chided the Corinthians. He said, if, if, you know, if another Jesus is preached, another spirit, you might just go for it. That's what's happening. It looks like Jesus is like loved by everybody, loved by the Muslims, you know, loved by, you know, uh, the New Age. It's just we just need to all come together and God's going to pull us out of this disastrous situation that we're in in the world. And he's going to hit it, the world with a planetary Pentecost, hit the world with with, you know, revival. No, basically what the Bible tells us is that the world is going to go down a deceptive path, which is it on, which it is on right now and that it's going to end up with Armageddon. The New Age, and I've lined this up and put quotes in my book, False Christ Coming, Does Anybody Care? They're basically saying Armageddon doesn't have to happen. But what does Jesus say, you know, to to John? In, at the beginning of Revelation, he says, this is prophecy. This is going to happen. Does Jesus tell us that Armageddon is going to happen because he, he wants to scare us or intimidate us or, or to have people who believe him look like we're being negative? No, he said, I see what's coming down, and we're going to have leaders who do not stand on the truth. And because people, Second Thessalonians, people don't have a love of the truth, they're going to perish. Jeremiah 9.3 talked about those who are not valiant for the truth. We want to feel good these days. Things are bad out there. You know, it's, it's understandable. Hey, just give me some good news. I mean, my dad went to a very liberal church when we were kids. And he said, I work hard all week. I want to hear, I want to hear something good. I don't want to hear any warnings. I don't want to hear anything bad. And I think that's, most Christians are like that. But unfortunately, the world is the world. And to think that we are all a part of God, which is coming into the church now. Leonard Sweet, who is not well known to the average Christian, but who's very well known at the higher levels of most denominations. In his book, Soul Tsunami, with a front cover endorsement by Rick Warren, Leonard Sweet said, to survive in the postmodern culture, you need to learn to speak out of both sides of your mouth. <sighs> That's where it's at. When you when people hear, well, I heard this preacher, you know, you know, declaring Jesus was his savior, and he quoted John 14, 6. The question is, what else does he say? Leonard Sweet says that Teilhard de Chardin, the father of the New Age movement, is 20th century Christianity's major voice. And then Sweet quotes Chardin saying that we see the faith in a much more magnificent way than our forefathers. The world is being deceived into thinking that God's doing a new thing and that he's bringing some kind of, you know, last-minute relief to a, a very depraved world and that somehow we're going to circumvent the cross and we're going to bring Jesus down from the cross. Nothing really happened on the cross. We just need to all, you know, recognize that we're all God, God's in everyone, and we can have a planetary Pentecost. I see this revival that Rodney Howard Brown says he's been led by God to orchestrate and to lead. I see that colliding and merging with the New Age Planetary Pentecost that I've described at length in my book, False Christ Coming. And that's the danger. And it yeah. can be stopped. This, this, we, can, we can stop and take a closer look at what real revival is. 
and I don't pretend to be an expert on real revival. We have many, many uh, men in the past and women that have authoritatively written about it, but it usually comes down to repenting of false teachings. Not yes. incorporating them into your revival. <laughs> Amen. Well, uh, Warren Smith, we are going to have to take a little break, my friend. But uh, folks, stick around. We're going to be back with our last segment with Warren Smith in just a moment. If you want more info on the topics of today's show, then visit StandUpForTheTruth.com. Now back to Amy Spreeman. Well, welcome back for our final segment with our friend Warren Smith. And, and Warren, I don't know if you heard our program a couple of days ago, but uh, we gave word from uh, the group Pulpit and Pen uh, of this um, Boy Who Came Back from Heaven, that book that was widely popular, um, total made-up story. Uh, in fact, the boy's mother sounded the warning in bookstores for years, uh, but her voice was drowned out by the sound of the cash register, unfortunately. And now uh, young Alex, 16 years old, wrote an open letter to uh, Lifeway and other booksellers saying, um, guess what? I did not die. I did not go to heaven. I said I went to heaven because I thought it would get me attention and uh, that kind of thing. But a lot of money has been made from these um, books about uh, going to heaven, haven't they? Yeah, you know, I was I was in a, a bookstore in the Edmonton, uh, uh, Canada airport, and uh, the clerk there and I were standing by the section of all these books that had to do with heaven. And I said, I said, uh, look at all these books on heaven. He goes, yeah, check this one out. The boy who came back from heaven and his name's Malarkey. <laughs> so it, the uh-huh. irony here is that you know uh, that, that that actually turned out to be the case. You know that. Uh, but, you know, Heaven is for Real, there's an interesting note on that mm-hmm. book. Um, Todd Burpo, who, the young boy who said he went up there and describes all the things that he saw, um, he said that, and this was at the end of the movie, Heaven is for Real, and at the end of his book, he said the only picture, the only painting he's ever seen of Jesus that looked like the Jesus that he saw was done by this young artist named Akiana. Akiana is a, sort of a child prodigy, and... Um, if her book's not out now, her book is going to be out soon. And it basically says that God's in everything. She's had New Age visions. She's been taken on trips. A lot of these trips to heaven that people are being taken on, I don't think people realize it, but, you know, I had a ball of light over my head in that first psychic reading. Uh, people can be taken on incredible voyages by um, delusion and deception. I mean, we're told that strong delusion is going to come in the last days. We're told there are going to be lying signs and wonders. Well, you know, I guess in a way, Malarkey's case is a lying sign and wonder. It looked like a sign and wonder, and everybody was getting excited, and a lot of books were sold, and it wasn't true. I think there are other cases where there's legitimate visions and dreams being given by the devil, and people think that they're from God. You know, all dreams are not from God. You know, there's a whole bevy of ways that uh, you can be approached in dream. Uh, so this idea that heaven is coming down to earth, you know, that's what Bethel's all about. We're bringing heaven down to earth in our worship services. We're, you know, we're, we're sending people through near-death experiences up to heaven. We've got a pastor, Steve Berger, outside Nashville, Tennessee. He and his wife are saying that their deceased son, Josiah, is communicating directly with them in their church. As a matter mm-hmm. of fact, in his book, Have Heart, Steve Berger says that, uh, quoting their assistant minister, Mr. Jim, that Josiah showed up in a church service and the assistant minister is quoted as saying that Josiah was there. He told his wife, Josiah was here and he spoke to me. You know, he spoke to me. I guess the, the pastor was thinking, is they were singing a hymn, is it is it worth it? It's going to be worth it. Some, something like that. And all of a sudden Josiah's there and he goes, Mr. Jim, it's way worth it, way worth it, Mr. Jim. And that's in the book. Wow. And then the, the Steve Berger, the pastor, says this is proof that our loved ones, you know, are watching and and can be involved in what we're doing. What has not been broadcast, I talked to Mr. Jim directly last year, and he said he is absolutely convinced that that was not Josiah now, that that was a familiar spirit. And I said, is this just kind of like a hunch, something you just kind of think? He said, no, I've really prayed about this. I've prayed about it deeply. So I don't think most Christians understand the extent that the devil can go to to create, you know, situations like that. So spiritual experiences need to be, that's why we have 1 John 4, 1, test the spirits. Many yeah. false prophets have gone out into the world. We need to be really careful, especially with these spiritual experiences. We need to measure everything by the word of God. But now we've got things like the message, 
In the middle of the Lord's Prayer in the message, Eugene Peterson put these words in Jesus' mouth, as above, so below. Well, I recognize that from the New Age. That's the key to all magic and all mysteries. It means that God's not only transcendent out there, he's imminent inside each and every person, mm. as above, so below. In a, another translation that's out, the voice, in uh, I think it's Second Peter 3, 18, um, it, you know, in the authoritative Bible, it talks about how Jesus will, you know, come and it's forever and ever. Uh, in the voice, it says Jesus is going to come until the new age mm. in this Bible. It's getting really, really bad. And I just hope that more people, uh, there have been voices in the past. David Jeremiah in 1995 warned about Richard Foster. He warned about the coming spiritual uh, formation. He warned about Bernie Siegel, the man that Rick Warren quotes at the beginning of The Purpose Driven Life. He, he, Jeremiah says that the New Age worldview is the most dangerous worldview to come into the church and that he, David Jeremiah, will not cease to warn about it night and day with tears. But guess what? He stopped warning about it. I haven't seen anything about the New Age from David Jeremiah. I hope that he will come and, and be one of the voices that will... Well, unfortunately, he's now quoting Leonard Sweet, quoting from the message, praising Rick Warren's peace plan. I, I'm not sure what's happening, Amy. It's it's pretty pretty wild out there. But we need to really be close to the Lord and just pray for truth, pray yeah. for truth day in and day out. I only want what's true, Lord. I don't want to be deceived. I don't want to follow leaders. I want to follow you and your truth, the true Jesus Christ. Warren, I, I think we ought to end this program with asking you about testing the spirits because you talked about the familiar spirits and uh, certainly you've experienced it as a former New Ager. Uh, what Can you give us just briefly some tips uh, that you see as crucial for testing the spirits? Well, um, I'll give a quick example. A friend of mine uh, who used to be in the New Age and he, he was a believer maybe like 10 or 15 years, went to a Christian retreat. He fasted and prayed for three days. He wanted to know and what ministry the Lord would have for him. He went out into a valley uh, or into a meadow uh, outside the conference in Oregon, and he prayed. He said, Lord, what ministry would you have me do? And he heard, you're going to be a healer. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, oh, okay, you know, and then he heard it again. And he said that uh, he res responded and said, well, yes, with you working through me, Lord. And he said he heard it a third time, and the hair stood up on his arm, and he said, Lord, it, Jesus Christ, if this is not you, take it away. And poof, it was gone. Wow. Just right in the middle of his prayer. I mean, here's a Christian retreat, fasting and praying. Perfect example of how a spirit can bang in. And you just because you hear something and because you've been praying, you still have to test the spirits. And I think that's the way that I've always felt like if there was something that was, you know, in the midst or around that uh, didn't feel right. Lord, if this, if, if this is not of you, please take it away. Um, we don't want anything that is not of you here. Now, yeah. what it basically says is that the test of the spirits is that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. What we're hearing from, like, the Course of Miracles and, and Oprah Winfrey is that everything's an illusion. Everything's mm -hmm. an illusion. And if it's an illusion, then he didn't come in the flesh. As a matter of fact, the Jesus of Oprah's Christianity, quote-unquote Christianity, New Age Christianity, he's asked... Are you the Christ? And he says, oh, yes, along with you. So you repeatedly, if somebody's hearing something and, they, and it's claiming to be Jesus, or God, it's like, did Jesus Christ come in the flesh? Johanna Michelson, in her book, The Beautiful Side of Evil, has a perfect example. And I, yeah. I actually put it at the beginning of my book about Sarah Young's book. Because Sarah Young, never, she never tests the spirits, never talks about testing the spirits. The only thing in there is that her Jesus says... You need discernment. Ask my spirit to give you discernment. Mm. Wait a second. If it's a if it's a, another Jesus, if it's a an unholy spirit, you're asking an unholy spirit to give you discernment. <laughs> exactly. So what she should have said is, did Jesus Christ come in the flesh? This is what John Michelson did. And you know what happened to the Jesus that was her Jesus in her laboratory, her yeah. what she thought was Jesus. She said when she when she confronted this Jesus, said did. Did Jesus Christ come in the flesh? She said it was like her meditation laboratory exploded, and that Jesus left forever. Amen. There are other Jesuses out there. We can't just say the name Jesus and expect it to be the true Jesus Christ. It has to be the one that died on the cross for our sins, who is resurrected, and whose Holy Spirit is sent to us when we believe 
in what he did on the cross and in him, not in the Jesus yeah. of Oprah Winfrey's reimagined Christianity or what's coming into the church. Well, Warren, thank you so much for that. And you know what, uh, folks, we have run out of time, but I uh, want to let you know that Warren Smith's uh, new pamphlet through Lighthouse Trails, False Revival Coming, Holy Laughter or Strong Delusion, and uh, that's part one, by the way. Stay tuned uh, for part two. But Warren, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks, Amy. Good to be with you.